start by by thanking RCMI and the Institute for the opportunity of spending the past couple of weeks here. It's been very stimulating. And I, I was born and raised here, and I remember driving past the Institute many times and wondering what, what the Institute was about. And it's, it's it, once, in one of my first interactions actually was with Jonathan when I came and, and learned about uh, his cockroach research. I, we, we actually wrote an article for Enrolli on that about four or five years ago. And then I always had these, these um, aspiration to be able to come here and interact with the scientists and uh, learn about what people were doing and maybe set up some collaborations and that, that was finally, that finally happened this year. So I wanted to thank the people that made it happen. And when I was walking out of the institute the other day, it looked like this and I was like, oh, perfect. Like it was, I don't know if you see it, there was like a double yeah, rainbow yeah. coming out of the institute. I was like, he's so quiet. <laughs> but uh, no, it's a really special place and I've, I've, it's been very stimulating to be here. And um, so thank you. So today I want to, I'm, I'm not going to be talking about Ciencia VR. I'm just going to focus completely on research. I'll be happy to talk to people about the outreach initiatives um, after the talk. But, but I, there's a lot of ground that I want to cover in terms of what I'm doing because I wanted to use this opportunity to just explain what our, what our research interests are, what we have been doing uh, for the past three years, and what we want to do. Because my hope is that, that this trip leads to some, some collaborations that allow me to come back and, and work regularly here at the Institute. So this is the conceptual question that my lab is interested in. And we don't use, I'm just going to quickly state that we don't use the human brain as a, as a model system, obviously. But this is the conceptual question that drives our research. So in the human brain, you have 100 billion neurons that form over 100 trillion synaptic connections. And immediately, you can see that there's a problem here with the approaches that we're taking in that there are only 25,000 genes in the human genome. So even if somebody were to walk through that door right now and tell us all the signals that are involved in the development of the human brain, which is what I'm interested in, that would be like somebody giving you the alphabet and you're trying to understand how the Library of Congress, how all the books in the Library of Congress were written. So these instructions are not sufficient to understand how this very complex structure forms. They're not prima facie. They're not enough instructions to, uh, to drive all of this complexity. We're missing some fundamental concepts besides the genetics, which is very important, that, that, that will help us understand how is it that, you, that this specificity emerges from the genome. So of course, my lab is interested in using C. elegans as a system to understand and discover the genetic factors that underpin this architecture. But beyond that, and I'll be talking a little bit about that in, in a new system that we have recently established, beyond that, we want to understand how these, these genetic factors are working as a system to drive the connectivity of the nervous system of the worm. And from there, draw lessons that might help us, uh, might help us understand how this complexity is in humans. So I'll be, I'll be far more specific in the next couple of slides. So when you think about well, our correct understanding of how you lay out the hardware for behaviors is that you have a self fate decision, then you have a guidance decision. Here's, here's exemplified by uh, you know some, some neurons here. You can see that that they're not beelining to to the to their final destination. Instead, they're actually taking this circumvented route. And we now understand from molecular genetics that there are signals that are expressed by guideposts that that uh, instruct different stages of the outgrowth of axons. And then, even after the axon has finally reached its target destination, it has to differentiate between many potential partners and innervate its correct synaptic partners. And if that stage that's known as synaptogenesis, then there's activity dependent maturation and elimination of synapses. My lab is particularly interested in this stage here of synaptogenesis, where after axon guidance has com concluded, you still have to differentiate between potential synaptic partners and innervate the correct ones. And I have taken an axon-centric point of view in describing the, the developmental sequence of events that lead to the connectivity of the circuit. But you have to remember that this is happening both in a presynaptic cell and a postsynaptic cell. And in vivo, it's happening simultaneously in, in hundreds of millions of neurons. And that, and that leads to the, to the formation of this fabulous organ that many of us are interested in, which is the brain. So I'm particularly interested in how this specificity is coordinated between the presynaptic cell and the postsynaptic partners. So I use the, the nematode C elegans 
as, as, the, novel, as the model system to understand this question. And there are a couple of reasons that I'm going to exemplify in the next couple of slides to, as to why we use this system. So instead of 100 billion neurons, C. elegans has exactly 300 neurons. And instead of 100 trillion synapses, it has approximately 7,000 synapses. There's plasticity in C. elegans, so this number changes depending on the developmental stage of the animal, the life, the life history of the animal. Besides the fact that it's very simple, the, the, the main reason why I decided to do my postdoc in C. elegans and continue with, in my lab with C. elegans is because it's the only animal for which mankind has the wiring of the whole nervous system. So we know that it has exactly 302 neurons because people have actually sat down and both recorded the lineage of every single cell and also uh, done electron micrographs across the animal and figure out where each of those 300 neurons are, the morphology of the neurons, the synaptic connectivity, and for many of them, we understand the behaviors which they regulate. So we have a, a, a huge amount of information. We have the answer key, basically, that allows us to then go back to the genetics and disrupt the system and, and understand how, how the genetics are controlling the development. In spite of the simplicity, there are many similarities between the basic components of the warm nervous system and our nervous system, or the vertebral nervous system. So this is an electron micrograph of a nematode uh, synapse and a vertebrate synapse. And you can see that at an ultrastructural level, there are many similarities. And the reason is because the, the molecules, the mechanisms that are underlying the development and function of these ancient structures, these synapses, are conserved throughout evolution. So I'm just going to underscore a couple of them. So synapses in C. elegans are formed en passant, which means along the length of the axon. In that sense, it's similar to the synapses that are formed in the central uh, nervous system of vertebrates. And the, the, in spite of the fact that C. elegans only has 302 neurons, the neurotransmitters and receptors that are present in us are also present in C. elegans. So namely acetylcholine, GABA, glutamate, serotonin, dopamine. All those neurotransmitters, and remember with that, the signaling pathways, the biogenesis, the packaging, all those mechanisms are actually also present in C. elegans. So, um, so today I, I wanted to tell you about a system we developed to, to look at synaptic specificity in C. elegans. And I'll, I'll be describing just one of the systems where we have, I, if I have time, I'll talk a little bit about the other one so that you can get a, a perspective. The, the, the reason that I chose the one that I'm going to be describing today is because the experiments that we have done exemplify how the system can be used to answer the questions that we're interested in. But it's not the only system that we have. So then I will talk a little bit about the role of guideposts in instructing the, the uh, synaptic specificity and synaptic maintenance in the nervous system. And I hope that towards the end of the talk, I will have convinced you that we have found that glia can act as guidepost in vivo to instruct the specific development of synapses at, at particular sites in the neuron. That netrin, which is, which if you've never heard of it, you'll hear a little bit, I'll give you an introduction, but if you, if you know, for those of you that are axon guidance aficionados, you might recognize netrin as a very important molecule that is required for correct guidance of, of axons over long distances. And uh, we have found, that among other, there are other groups that have found similar things, but we have found that netrin is involved in synaptic formation and is acting as a short range cue. And then we have recently identified that glia play a very important role also in the maintenance of where synaptic, synaptic connections are, are kept. So let me tell you first about the, about the system that we have used. So, this is, uh, can we lower the lights a little bit? In the yeah, right behind you. Oh, uh, here, okay. So I just, okay, that's great. So, the main thing that we can do in C. elegans that has been really powerful for us is that, and, and this is actually, we're piggyback writing on, on, on uh, work that other colleagues have done in C. elegans, is that we can, people, when they discover genes, they uh, characterize the promoter regions of those genes. And we're interested in driving the expression of specific markers in specific cells. So we can take that information, which is kept in this really well-organized databases by the field, and then we can identify promoters that are expressed in, in cells that we're interested in. And throughout my talk, everything that I'm going to be describing was done in vivo using these promoter regions that drive expression in specific cells. So for instance, here I'm using two of those promoter regions. One of them 
drives expression in this AIY interneuron. This interneuron is actually embedded in the nematode nerve ring. This is, this is a cartoon diagram of the head of the worm. And this neuron is, there, there are hundreds of other neurons that you're not seeing there because we're expressing so specifically RFP in this, in this interneuron using this specific promoter region. We're also using a different promoter region to drive UFP in the postsynaptic partner. So we can simultaneously see the presynaptic cell and the postsynaptic cell with single cell resolution. And that's powerful because it allows us to do two things. One of them is that it allows us to probe in vivo uh, the cell biological events that are taking place in, in these cells in live animals, right? The second thing is that then we can do genetics. We can actually take these live animals and we can mutagenize them, we can look at the progeny, we can identify the molecules that are required for the correct uh, development and connectivity. And we know, because we know the wiring diagram, which other people have, have already figured out, we know uh, how these neurons are supposed to connect to each other. So we can, we can uh, compare all of our in vivo work with this fluorophores with what's known by EM. So the same way that we can take those specific promoters and write, in this case, it's a cytoplasmic marker that allows us to look at the morphology of the presynaptic cell here and its postsynaptic partner. We can actually drive whatever we want. We're interested in synapses, so we drive synaptic markers. So this is now in this red neuron, which is the presynaptic one. And what we're expressing here, using the same promoter but a different uh, marker, we're expressing the synaptic vesicle-associated protein RAP3 fused to a fluorophore. So that allows us to look at synaptic vesicles. And what we see is that, first, the first thing that I'll mention is that when we, we can look at, we, we've now looked at thousands and thousands of, of these wild type animals, and they all have a similar pattern to the one that you're seeing here, which I'm gonna describe briefly. There is a region that's proximal to the cell body, which you're not seeing here because it doesn't have any synapses, but it's where the star is, that, that this region here, which we call zone one, you don't see any signal because there are no presynaptic specializations formed there. There are no synaptic vesicles accumulating in that region. Then there's a synaptic rich region that forms in this, in this area, which we call zone two, and then there's these discrete clusters of presynaptic specializations that are forming this distal part of the inner eye, which we call some three. Now, when you look at the EM, we, you find that, that actually these regions that are cell biologically distinct correspond to functionally distinct areas. So this region here of some one, we know by EM, is fasciculated, it's adjacent to over half a dozen other neurons. But it's not forming presynaptic specializations onto them. And that's important because it's not sending, you know, it's not relaying a signal to them. Then this, this region here, the, the, I want to underscore that you don't have to remember the name of these of these postsynaptic partners, but do note that these ones are different from these ones. So in in these two regions, if this neuron is actually forming presynaptic specializations onto distinct postsynaptic partners. Why why is that important? Well it's important because this is analogous to what we see. In, in the neocortex of humans, for example, where you have synaptic specificity that's forming at two levels. Synaptic specificity forms at the level of who you connect to, specific partners. Everyone, everyone understands that. And that's what most people think of when they think about synaptic specificity. But it also forms at the level of a stereotype location. It's not only who you connect to, but where. Like, for example, in these gabaritic circuits in the neocortex, chandelier basket and bitopter interneurons connect to pyramidal interneurons specifically. But it's not only remarkable that they connect to pyramidal interneurons specifically, it's that they do so by targeting subcellular regions. The chandelier connects at the axon initial segment, the basket at the proximal dendrite, and the bicopter at the distal dendrite. And in that sense, the decisions that these neurons in CRGAS have to make are analogous to the decisions that these neurons have to make in, our, in, in the neocortex. So it allows us to model this kind of developmental problem in CRGAS. So, so we were interested in looking at Synaptic specificity at those two levels, partner selection and stereotype location. Ah, yeah, oh, sorry, you yes, of course. Yeah, please feel answer. free to interrupt me. Yeah. Okay, so I was wondering the nature of your marker. So, RAP3 is basically a vesicle protein, it's not an active zone protein. Right. So, basically, your data showing directly so when synapses are not there, vesicles don't have RAP3. Right. So, so you're, you're absolutely right. So, um, everything I've shown you so far is just RAP3 subcellular localization. We have, we have developed a, an array of markers that we have, some of them I'm gonna be showing you later, that allows us to look at, we have two or three different actison proteins uh, labeled, which show the, display the same pattern. And we also have other, because RAP3, the, the association with the vesicle is, is uh, it can be regulated. 
we also have other um, other vesicle proteins such as synaptobrevin, um, synaptophysin, other vesicle proteins that allows us to look at the at this observable localization of the vesicles. But yes, I, 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 thanks for reminding me about that. So we can, because as I mentioned, the pattern that I described was very stereotypical across individual animals. We can do one of the things that people regularly do with these genetic systems, which is a forward genetic screen. And we did that looking for things that disrupted, uh, basically things that disrupted, as you see here, you go from a continuous signal to like a reduction of signal, um, as shown here. And we found, we, we isolated a number of mutants, some of, some of them, I'll, tell you all briefly because they're published. Some of them I'll spend more time on because they're, they're, there's this work on preparation. And some of them I won't be talking about. But the important thing is that this screen was very productive. And we focused on things that did not affect cell migration or axon guidance, but disrupted the patterning, the presynaptic patterning of this neuron. And here's one of the mutants. I'll spend very little time. Well, this is the wild type. I'll show you the mutant in a second. I'll spend very little time talking about it because it's published. But basically, this is how, just to remind you, this is how the wild type pattern looks. I want to draw your attention to this region, which is the easiest one to, to see the difference if you're not familiarized with the pattern. And you can see that in wild type, there's a continuous high clustering of presynaptic specializations in this region, in this case, synaptic vesicles. And in the mutant, we observed that there were still uh, synaptic vesicles clustering in that region, but there was a, a very significant and dramatic reduction of the number of presynaptic vesicles. This was quantified, and, and it's, all, it's all in the paper that we published. And um, I, you know, the thing with genetics is that you end up with the mutant. You don't know what it is. So before you actually uh, identify the genetic lesion, you do a lot of characterization to see if it's going to be interesting. So I, when I isolated this mutant, I convinced myself that this, as I mentioned before, that this wasn't due to guidance, that this was a presynaptic patterning problem. And we didn't know the genetic identity. So once I knew the genetic identity, I had to, which was actually the genetic identity of this mutant is a receptor that's known to affect guidance. So at that point, if I had known the genetic identity, I would have talked myself out of working in this project because I would have thought, well, maybe it's a guidance problem. Maybe there's some fine guidance I'm not detecting. Well, I had spent so much time characterizing this mutant that I knew it wasn't guidance. So I had to face the reality that, 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 I, that I couldn't, couldn't be biased in the other direction. You know? So we characterized the, how, this, how this phenotype resulted from this mutation, and uh, very briefly, again, it's not the result of guidance and, and all that data is in the paper. So then we started wondering, is this a, maybe a, a new role for this receptor in presynaptic assembly? And it turned out that, that well, again, just very briefly, what, what is this molecule? This is a cross-section of C. elegans, and here's a cross-section of, of a vertebrate. This molecule is actually conserved through our evolution. It's acting similarly in C. elegans as it does in vertebrates and in other organisms. It was originally discovered in C. elegans, and that informed the, the work in vertebrates. And it was, it was uh, also independently isolated by the Tertiolabin group in vertebrates. And, but it, it's working in, a, in, a, in an analogous fashion, which is that the ligand of these, basically the receptor is expressed by neurons that are, that are uh, projecting commissures to, to, uh, to regions of the animal. And then, if the receptor is expressed alone, in C. elegans it's called 40, in vertebrates it's called DCC, then it senses the ligand, which is, in C. elegans it's expressed by cells in the ventral side, in, in uh, vertebrates it's expressed by uh, neuroepithelial cells that are also on the ventral side, and that forms, that's thought to form a gradient that's then sensed by this receptor, and that instructs the guidance of, of these commissural neurons. There's another receptor that's called on 5 in C. elegans. It's also called on 5 in vertebrates. That when, when, it, when the cell co-expresses that receptor with this, with this other one, this is the one that we found, then that results in repulsion. But, so these are the, the, the two main netrin receptors. And this is, this is a, you know, a very quick primer on how netrin works in guidance. But again, I want to underscore that we did not find that it was involved in guidance. What we did find through, through a series of experiments that are again published, is that the receptor is expressed by this presynaptic cell, and the receptor actually localizes to the presynaptic regions, as I show you, it's required for presynaptic specialization formation. Uh, we did this with, with actisome markers. We characterized this phenotype with actisome markers and synaptic vesicle markers. And, um, 
And, ba and basically what we found was that the reason that this receptor is actually clustering there and driving the formation of presynaptic specializations in this region is because there's a glia cell that, I'm going to skip over this part quickly. There's a glia cell that is, that is expressing the ligand. So, so this glia cell, by expressing the ligand, instructs the localization of the receptor to, to, to this region and the formation of presynaptic specializations. So this was interesting at the time because um, we found, and, and we did a lot of experiments that, I, that I'm not describing, but basically we found a role for glia in orchestrating circuit assembly in vivo, and then we found a new role for this known pathway in guiding presynaptic assembly. So when, when, when I, a lot of that work was done when I was a postdoc. When I started my lab, I was interested in focusing on these questions. I've been pursuing both of them. I'll tell you um, quickly that, that after our work came out, it was shown by, by Josh Wang's lab that, that glia can also orchestrate circuit assembly in vertebrates. His work was in the cerebellum. And uh, Susanna Cohen Gori's <coughs> group uh, recently published that Netrin plays a role in vertebrates in, in instructing the formation of presynaptic sites. So these mechanisms that, that, that I just described were, are conserved and important in vertebrates as well throughout evolution. So I'll tell you briefly about some of the work that we have been doing in terms of identifying the signals by which this, this signal, or this netring Q, which is involved in guidance, actually instructs uh, this newfound role of presynaptic assembly. So the reason that we decided to pursue that question, like why do we care about the fact that this receptor is involved in presynaptic assembly? Well, one of the reasons is that it's, it's a conserved role, as I showed you, like Susanna cohen Cori or mentioned, Susanna cohen Cori is going to show that it's conserved throughout evolution. And we had a great system to visualize both the, guide, the role of this receptor in guidance and presynaptic assembly, because as I mentioned briefly, this receptor was originally identified in C. elegans as important for guidance, and we have we have discovered that it also played a, an independent role in presynaptic assembly. So, so and then um, we thought, like I started with this question when I when I started with the introduction of the conceptual questions that that that, that my lab is interested in. And I mentioned that there are 25,000 genes and 100 trillion synapses, and here you have molecular multitasking effectively. This is a, a molecule that's known to be important in guidance, that people have shown that was important in guidance, now we're showing that it's important in presynaptic assembly. And I thought as a neuroscientist and a developmental biologist, if we really want to understand how these different cues are orchestrating the formation of the nervous system in vivo, we have to understand what are the downstream signals that are parceling out the cellular responses that in some situations result in guidance and in other situations result in, in presynaptic assembly. So we decided to pursue this question. The, the work that I'm going to discuss is Andrea Stavos and is, is currently actually on, on the review at uh, Journal of Cell Biology. Yeah, Journal of Cell Biology. So it, it got positive reviews. So I'll, I'll mention it briefly, so, some of the work that we did so I can move on to something that's completely new. So the question that she started with was uh, pretty straightforward. She wanted to understand how this receptor is such presynaptic assembly. Uh, people have already identified signaling pathways of how this receptor instructs guidance. So she started with the question, well, are the molecular signals that are required for guidance also required for presynaptic assembly? And if they are, how are they, why do they result in presynaptic assembly in this neuron? So she, she did a lot of experiments that, that I'm not going to mention because they, they resulted in negative data where that basically showed that a, a lot of molecules that she, she, she tested in this part of the cascade and this part of the cascade were not required for presynaptic assembly. Instead, she found evidence that it was this part of the signal in cascade through racks that instruct presynaptic assembly. And let me tell you some about, about some of the experiments that, that she did. So it's known that this receptor interacts with a GEF that in C. elegans is called set 5 In vertebrates, it's called DOG180. And that that GEF is important in regulating downstream of the receptor guidance. So we were interested in understanding, well, is this GEF, that which, which is going to directly interact with the receptor, is it also important for presynaptic assembly? So we, this is just, the, again, a picture of the wild type animal. You can see like the, that thick cluster, no synapses, discrete cluster of presynaptic specializations. 
And when we looked in the in that mutant, we first, and I'm not showing you this data, we, we, we saw that it didn't affect guidance. And then, but we observed that it had a very dramatic phenotype in terms of presynaptic uh, assembly in, in, in this region. There was a very severe reduction. When we made, as geneticists, if one of the things that you do to see if two things are in the same pathway is that you make a double mutant and see if the phenotype gets worse or changes. If they're in the same pathway when you make the double mutant, it should look similar to the single mutant. And that's one of the interpretations. So we made the double mutant, and we observed that the double mutant, particularly in this region, looks similar to the single mutant. We saw a, a very significant reduction of presynaptic specializations as compared to the wild type. So then we decided to look at the subcellular localization of this molecule. So when we express this molecule cell-specifically in, in animals, we observed that it, it was uh, enriched at the regions where presynaptic specializations were forming. This is, again, that dash box. It's, the neuron is, you cannot see the neuron because it's not going anywhere else in, in this molecule, but basically the neuron is going this way. And that lo subcellular localization was dependent on the natrium receptor. If we looked at the subcellular localization in non 40 mutants, we observed that these, these uh, set 5 GFP was incapable of, of clustering the way that it did in wild type in natrium. Actually, what we see is that it's going to sites that look like, like the, the presynaptic sites that do form in the mutant animals. So we hypothesized that, that set 5 was acting downstream of, this recept of the natrium receptor in instructing presynaptic formation, and that it, it was doing so by localizing in response to the natrium receptor to the sites where synapses were going to form. And we, we thought, well, if this is true, then maybe we can do the following experiment. Maybe we can, if, if the whole role of the receptor is to, to, if you remember, I mentioned that the receptor localizes the presynaptic sites in the first place. If the whole role of the receptor is to bring the GEF to the site where synapses are going to form, then maybe what we can do is we can make a chimeric protein, where we can make a receptor fused to the GEF and see if that is capable of rescuing the GEF defect. Okay. So that will show that the direct interaction between the receptor and the GEF is, is, is all that is needed to drive the, the formation of presynaptic specializations. And when we did that experiment, indeed, we observed that this chimeric protein was capable of fully, re fully rescuing the defect that we observed in these set by mutants. Okay. So doing doing experiments like this, so, so basically we then walk down the pathway, and here I'm gonna summarize a lot of <laughs> here I'm gonna summarize this is another summary slide. Uh, the reason I'm I'm giving you the summary slides is because I really want to be able to give you a bird's eye view of all the different things that the lab is doing. But I'll be happy to discuss this in greater detail. But basically what we found was that the glia cell is secreted in natrium, which then drives the localization of the natrium receptor to the site where the presynaptic sites are going to form. The natrium receptor then drives the localization, the subcellular localization of this calf, which then activates a rack, which then drives the subcellular localization of, of an adapter molecule called mitema melipodi, which is a regulator, regulator of the active cytoskeleton. And we actually went on to show that that regulated the, the the uh, nucleation of, of F actin at this presynaptic site, which was crucial for the localization of presynaptic vesicles to the, to the presynaptic sites. So, so doing experiments similar to the one that I just described by, by looking at mutants and looking at the subcellular localization, we were able to elucidate this whole pathway. This is what that paper is about. Um, so why, why is this? I, I always like to bring home the point of the importance. Why is this? this work important? Like why, why, why would anyone that doesn't work in this pathway care? And the reason that I care about it is because these molecules, all of these molecules, have been previously shown to be important in guidance. So, so they actually affect the active cytoskeleton to drive <coughs> the growth cone, to drive the cellular response to guidance cues, and the development of the nervous system. What we found in this case is that what's different between this receptor in some cellular context instructing guidance and in other cellular context instructing presynaptic assembly, it's not that it's going through different signaling pathways. It's going through the same signaling pathways and it's actually affecting the cytoskeleton. But what's different is the subcellular localization. 
these all of while while in an, in a cell that's growing out, all of these molecules actually localize to the growth point. In this case, these molecules are actually localizing to the site, to the future site of synapse formation. And that subcellular localization is organizing the active cytoskeleton in this case to cluster these synaptic vesicles in that region. Now, that obviously brings the question, well, why is it that in this cell, those molecules are, the, the cell biological localization is different? Why is it that, that these molecules are localizing to presynaptic sites? I mean, they're not, that doesn't result in the formation of a growth one, for example. And what we have found, which is, which is something that, that I'll, I'll mention, but I'm not going to talk about this, this lack of time, but I'll, I'll happy to talk about it in our individual meetings, is that there are different isoforms of this molecule, which is an adapter molecule. And this adapter molecule is actually, um, is actually taking this signal cascade, and, and the, the different isoforms of this adapter molecule either localize to the growth cone, or they localize to the presynaptic sites. And it's the subcellular localization of those isoforms that's actually um, uh, instructing this, the cellular response to the to the netrin cue that is actually coming from the from the extracellular space. Is that does that make sense? Okay. So um, so the reason the reason that I thought that that that, that conceptual insight that, that that fell out of that research is important is because. When, I, when we found that netrin was re required for presynaptic assembly at the time, that was, um, it's going to be four years now, four years ago, three years ago, it, it, it was a novel observation. But since then, if you look at every major family of guidance cues, there are multiple labs that have published multiple papers. I didn't have enough space here to cite all the papers, so I just cite the labs, where they show that these molecules also have, also regulate aspects of synaptic biology. So this, there's an underlying thing here where these cues that were originally thought to be just guidance cues are really not guidance cues. They're more than guidance cues. They're regulating multiple aspects of, of synaptic formation and synaptic biology. So what, what is going on? And, and that, you know, then I, I think we, and the, I'm, I'm not the only one that's positive this, but basically what, what our research suggests is that we have to rethink this module as a guidance cue. This is more like a, like a polarity cue or a cell recognition cue. And the real, if, if that's the case, and the real <coughs> cues that are parceling out this, the developmental response to the, to, the, to the ligand are downstream cues that are telling the cell to either move or grow uh, an axon or form presynaptic sites. And that the reason that I, that I, that I thought that was, that was cool was because, again, this, is, this goes back to this concept that, you know, as geneticists, of course, I want to, sorry, as geneticists, of course, I want to identify new molecules that are that are involved in presynaptic assembly, and and, and we have we are, the second part of the talk. I'll talk to you all some new molecules that, that are involved in, in synaptic maintenance, but but more broadly, there are not enough molecules to, to direct all the different synaptogenic events that we see. So how are these? How is this molecular multitasking? How is this recycling of of, of these of these modules? Instructing different developmental events with these downstream signaling pathways is, is actually, a, I think, it's going to be a key question if we want to understand something that Roger Sperry, which was the one that posited the chemoaffinity interpretation in the first place, brought up when he posited the chemoaffinity interpretation. So, um, so I'm going to shift gears a little bit and, and uh, tell you about a new system that we have that we have established to try to look at this at this question that, that I just brought up. How is it that with a limited set of, of, of instructions you coordinate the formation of a nervous system? Uh, a new system that, that I hope will allow us to, to, to get to that question. So this is a three-word collaboration that, that I established between uh, Siron Bao, who's a uh, faculty at Sloan Kettering. And uh, basically what Siron's background, he's a computer scientist. And he's a computer scientist turned developmental biologist. And what he did was that he uh, he labeled histones in C. elegans embryos in a very similar way to the, to the labeling techniques I just described to you that we use in neurons. And that allows him to look at the position of, of nuclei in the embryo. Here's an embryo there for nuclei. Now, in C. elegans, we know the lineage of every single cell. It's like a family tree, and we know what each cell is and what it's going to become. This was done in the 1960s, and a couple of people ended up winning the Nobel Prize because that's, that's how they found that 
uh, that some cells were always destined to die, and then they identified the molecular signals that, that uh, regulate apoptosis. So what, what Sirong did was that he used that information, and then he trained a computer to do what these people did by eye 40 years ago. So at any given time, the computer is tracking these cells as they're dividing, because we know the lineage. This is like a story that we know how it ends. We know the, what each cell is and what it's going to become. And here he's actually tracking different cell lineages in different colors. So, the, so I, I, when I saw this, I, I thought, well, this is really powerful, because if we can put four activatable markers here, then we, we know what each cell is and what it's going to become. Then we can actually target specific cells for activating markers and, and visualize their development in real time in the animal. And if we do it for the 300 neurons, then we can end up with an atlas. We can end up with a real time atlas of, of how the animal develops. The problem was that we couldn't do it at the time because the microscopes that he was using to do this work were proper <coughs> microscopes that were too, too slow. And that those images are taken every minute. And they result in photobleaching. So they result in photobleaching and, and phototoxicity. A lot of the animals die in the process of doing this imaging. So you could only do it like a couple of hours into development, and then the animals will stop developing. So we collaborated with a microscopist at the NIH. His name is Harry Shroff. And um, well, Harry, Harry builds microscopes. That's what he does. He's more of a physicist than a biologist. And he developed a microscope that, that basically allows us to look at these same events, but 30 times faster than a confocal microscope. So this is that same movie at the same time, but but you can, you can see that it looks much more continuous. It doesn't look as choppy. And the reason is because we can image the animal from the moment it's a cycle all the way until it hatches 14 hours later, whole volumes every two seconds. Actually, it goes so fast that we can do, and we can do multiple colors that we can do this. We can actually take, this is an animal much further along in development. Again, you're only seeing a two-dimensional projection, but I want to remind you these are four-dimensional data sets. We can, we can turn it around any, any way we want. In this particular movie, the animal is going to turn itself. So in red, we have all the nuclei labels, so the computer is keeping track of what each cell is and what it's going to become. And in green, we have specific neurons that we're interested in visualizing their neural development. And soon, the animal is, on, is on, on, going to undergo a relation uh, here in the, the, the movie. Then you're going to see that we're going to be able to track the, the migration of these two cells as the animal is turning. There's, there's uh, axon guidance decisions that are being made over here. And then, and even when the animal is turning, <coughs> you're not seeing motion blur. And the reason you're not seeing motion blur is because this microscope is going so fast in collecting the volumes that you can actually stop it at a specific, at any given time, and you can measure the outgrowth of, of different, of different uh, of different growth bonds and neurons as they're, as they're innervating. So we're using this now. This, this is actually, for C. elegans, this has actually been, it's a very powerful system because it allows us to do something that we couldn't do before, which is that because the animal is continuously twitching after it starts developing its nervous system. The, before, people couldn't really probe the development of the nervous system after the animal started developing the nervous system. So a lot of our analysis is like the one that I showed you in the first part of the talk, which is endpoint analysis. And now we can see it in, in real time. And we're examining the, the role of glia as, as the whole nervous system is, is assembling. And the, the eventual goal, again, this animal has, in embryogenesis, it has 206 neurons. So the, the eventual goal is to actually build an animal atlas where we can have a, a movie of the extinction of every single of every single cell as, it's, as, it's, uh, as the nervous system is coalescing, and, to, and to, to build into that the genetics so that we can really get to the, to the question of like how is it that you are, as a system, um, instructing specificity with a limited set of molecular cues. So we can discover them by genetics, and then we can put them into the system and see how, how that molecule is, is regulating multiple processes. That's, that's the vision with this. I'm going to finish with, with something completely new that came out of the screen, which I think, which, I, which, I, which I'm pretty excited about. And uh, it turns out that I, I, I like to finish with this because it, it's an example of, of some work that we did doing basic research that has had, um, that could have a biomedical implication just because of the nature of the, of, the, uh, of the mutant that we isolated. So again, we did the forward genetic screen, much as we did the other one, but in this case, we focused on things that 
So, so all the other screen that I described, we were focusing in this region. In this screen, we focused on on animals that display ectopic <coughs> presynaptic specializations in this region that normally does not form presynaptic specializations. We were really interested in molecules that either eliminate synapses or prevent synapses from forming at ectopic sites. That was the that was the goal behind this. This is um, so this is visualizing the, the synaptic vesicles with RAF3. And this is actually the only slide I'm gonna, this is the work of, of postdoc, postdoctoral fellows in George Chow. And so here is a, a actisome molecule, C1. And this is the pattern that you see in wild type animals. So you see a similar pattern to the one that you see for RAF3. This is not the same animal, it's a different animal, but you can see a similar pattern. But basically in the mutants, this, this phenotype that we're seeing does not result from a trafficking defect in synaptic vesicles. It actually results from, from, from the formation of ectopic presynaptic sites. Because we can see actisons also ectopically localized into that region, and we have now done EM, and we can see dense, dense core, uh, de dense projections in this in this region where they normally do not form. They do not form. So again, the phenotype of this mutant is that you get these ectopic presynaptic sites that you don't get in wild type animals. So what was interesting about this mutant also was that when you look at the adults, they look like what I just described. You get these, these ectopic synapses in this region. But when you look at the juvenile worms, they look perfectly wild. -type. So, so this this wasn't a developmental problem. It was a maintenance problem, <coughs> and it wasn't a maintenance problem in the traditional sense of synapses breaking down. It was more like a, I, I don't, I, I'm trying to think about a term that I can use. I haven't come up with one, but it's basically a maintenance of the position of these synapses, not a maintenance of, of the synapses being present or absent. Okay, so the synapses are now forming here abnormally. The phenotype is very dramatic, so he went on to clone the, the lesion and uh, very briefly, if, 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 like, like uh, Tom Schwartz was saying last week, if you're not a geneticist, maybe you don't care about this slide, but this, this summarizes many months of a lot of work where he, uh, by positional uh, mapping, he, he identified where these things were, where this mutation was, uh, was present. And what the important thing to, to note here is that after bipositional mapping, he identified where, in what region it was, there are a number of uh, phosphates. Phosphates are similar to, to yaks that you can then inject into the worms to see which ones rescue. So he injected about 40 of them that covered that region, and he got rescued for two of them. This was very lucky because the two of them that he got rescued for overlapped in, in a specific region. So immediately the hypothesis there is, well, the gene must be in that region of overlap. And in that region of overlap, there were two genes. And it turned out that, that, that he, he could amplify these different genes. It turned out that the gene that rescued, so this is the mutant, this is an animal, a mutant animal, but now expressing this gene, and it's rescued. You see no, no uh, ectopic formation of the synaptic specializations. It turned out to be this unnamed gene, so f 45 e 4.11. So we took the sequence, and we, uh, we, we sequenced the gene, and we found actually that it had a glycine to glutamate uh, missense mutation, and we confirmed it was the only allele in C. elegans for this gene. That's why it was unnamed, so we confirmed it by RNAi. Uh, so what is this gene? So it's a 12 transmembrane domain protein, and it turns out to be a permease of the major facilitator superfamily. I'll, I'll talk more about this in a second. But uh, it's conserved across evolution, and in humans, it's actually, this gene is, is known, and this gene is very well characterized. It's actually my I haven't been working in C. elegans for that long, but it's the, certainly my first experience and one of the only times that, I, that I've heard about human genetics being way ahead of C. elegans. The reason that it's known from human genetics is because this gene in humans results in disease. And so Cialin is an anion sugar transporter that's known to localize to vesicular compartments, especially lysosomes. It's capable of transporting Cialic acid. And again, most of what is known about it comes from human genetic studies. So we know very little about the cell biology of it. And there are a number of alleles that have been identified. I have here some of them that have been identified of this gene in humans. Uh, different families that have mutations in this gene uh, have, have diseases. Like there are two main diseases that were first uh, uh, noted by, by the phenotype that they have in the families. But it turns out that they're both resulting from the same gene. 
So there's an infantile free sialic acid storage disorder, which is a very severe disease, and then there's a more milder form of the disease, a SARS disease, and this, this corresponds to different alleles that form into, that fall into different parts of the gene. They're both rare autosomal recessive disorders, and they, they both result in neurological complications such as seizures, involuntary movement, ataxia, hypotonia, and cognitive impairments. So, um, and, and they, they result in hypomyelination, neurodegeneration, and death. So we, we decided to call this gene uh, CIMA1 for circuit maintenance. And, and um, we saw that the site where this glycine to glutamate transition was very well conserved across evolution. And one of the things is that, so it, cyanine, people don't know how cyanine, why cyanine results in disease. They know from human genetic studies that it's important. But the cell biology is not known, and the, the mechanism is not known, it's not understood. It's hypothesized that, so the way that you have to understand the history of how these genes were named in the first place to understand a little bit of the hypothesis. So in humans, there's, there's uh, accumulation of sialic acid in the urine. So when they see a child or a family with a, with a history of, of mental retardation, seizures, hypotonia, and then they see accumulation of sialic acid, then that's how they, that's how they, they say, well, this person has Salas disease. That led to the hypothesis that this transporter in, that can localize the vesicular cell compartments is important in, in transporting sialic acid. So then they did biophysical studies where they showed that the transporter was capable of transporting sialic acid. So then they stitched together this hypothesis, which might or might not be true, where basically, well, they, they know that sialic acid is important in, in sialic acid is a, is, a, is a sugar that is important in, in regulating cell adhesion, and uh, it's important, for example, for NCAM. So they came up with this hypothesis of like, well, maybe sialic acid is not being transported out of the lysosome, and that's what's actually affecting, that's what's resulting in disease. So, did everyone follow that? Now, here's the problem with the hypothesis with our model. There's no sialic acid in CLA. Okay. So either in CLA acid is acting differently, or that hypothesis is wrong in humans. So, and in humans, there's no way of making a human without sialic acid. So, so we decided to try to understand how is it that this gene is acting in CLA ions. And it turns out that this gene in CLA we looked at the expression pattern, and we observed that it was expressed in epidermal cells, both epidermal cells that are um, that are the skin of the animal, so to speak, and also epidermal cells in the intestine. And uh, then we, we did cell-specific rescue. The way that we do this is that we can take, for example, this is the wild type, this is the, the, this is the percentage of animals that display the mutant phenotype. Wild type does not display the mutant phenotype. The mutants do display the mutant phenotype. If we express it cell-specifically <coughs> in the neuron that we are studying, we do not get rescued. What that means is that the effect that we're seeing in that neuron is non-cell autonomous. It's resulting from this gene acting in another tissue that's not this neuron. So what tissue is it acting? Well, it's acting in epidermal cells. So if we express it in epidermal cells, we can get rescued. So the way that we can express it cell-specifically in epidermal cells is that there are a number of promoters similar to the promoters that I talked about that we use to visualize specific cells. There are a number of promoters that we can use to drive the expression in epidermal cells. So, uh, we, what we know from, at this point, what we knew from CIMA is that it's a 12 transmembrane domain protein similar to cyanine that it was required for presynaptic maintenance, that is expressed and required in epidermal cells, but we didn't understand how it regulates presynaptic maintenance. So then, uh, what we did, we, in order to try to understand this, we looked at the EM uh, that was previously done in the wiring diagram of the, of the worm, and this is, this is how the EM looks when you actually look at the, at the database, but basically, let me just color code this for simplicity. This is, this is the neurons, this is a cross-section. These are the neurons, that, a cross-section of the neurons, AIY, that, we've been, that I've been talking about for the last 45 minutes. This is the position of the epidermal cell. So what's in between the epidermal cell and the neurons? Because the epidermal cell is not in direct contact with the neurons. And what's in between there is actually a glial cell. So the same glial cell that we had previously seen was important directing the development. Now, I want to remind you that this is a maintenance phenotype. So we decided to look at the glia cell. This is how, well, this is not projecting great, but basically here, here in green, this is the, uh, the, the presynaptic 
the thick presynaptic clustering that I talked in the first half of my talk. This is the region where you see no ectopic synapses. This is how the glia cell looks. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very large cell, but most of it is above the plane of where the synapses are forming. So if you actually look at the plane, and this, this is polished, of where the synapses are forming, they're, they're, there's, the glia cell projects these, 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 uh, these projections, basically, that are, that are in direct contact, very specific and direct contact with those presynaptic sites. So how do they look in the juvenile mutants? Well, they look similar to wild type. We don't see anything grammatically different. But then when we looked at the glia cell in mutant adults, we observed that these glia cells were abnormally distended now to this region here. Um, and do, and they, they covered the region where we now saw the ectopic synapses forming, in that, in that region where normally the ectopic synapses are forming. So that led us to, to and the, again, this is, this is happening similar to the ectopic synapse phenotype is happening between juvenile and adults. It's not a developmental thing. So that led us to hypothesis, and okay, so this is very quickly, we collaborated with Shigeki Watanabe and Eric Jorgensen's lab at Utah, and they did a reconstruction of this region here in the mutants. What they have is a microscope where you can simultaneously do EM and fluorescence microscopy. So we can, in, oh, sorry. So in green here, in green here, you're seeing the neuron that we're interested on. Those are, these are the dense projections of the ectopic synapses. And they, they reconstructed it, and they basically what this EM shows is that they're seeing the same thing by EM that we were seeing in, with our fluorescent markers. They see the glia normally present in that region. They start seeing synapses forming in that region, which are normally not there. So again, and then, so then we, we asked, well, maybe, maybe this gene is acting in the glia. And the gene is not acting in the glia. We cannot get rescue if we express the gene cell specifically in the glia. If we can only get rescue if we express the cell specifically in the epidermal cells. So that led to two hypotheses. Hypothesis one is that these are two independent phenotypes. This gene is required for the glia morphology. It's also required for the presynaptic patterning. But these two things, although they look like they look similar, they're disconnected. So the epidermal cell is, through the expression of this gene, is regulating both glia morphology and presynaptic patterning. Hypothesis two is that these two things are connected. The epidermal cell, in some ways, regulating glia morphology which then is regulating presynaptic pattern. So if the, to differentiate between these two, we decided to ablate glia. In this case, if you ablate glia, you should not affect the presynaptic patterning. In this case, if you ablate the glia, you should suppress the, the presynaptic pattern. People follow that? Okay. So, so we, did, we did that experiment, and we observed that this is, again, the mutant phenotype, and we observed that ablation of the glia in, in this mutant background suppress the phenotype of, of ectopic synapses in this region. So that argued in favor of the second hypothesis where and this is just a quantification of the percentage of animals where we see this. We don't get we don't get complete ablation and consistent with that we observe that about half of the animals where we ablate the glia we see a reduction of the we see an elimination of the of the ectopic synapses that are forming in that so yeah. Is that the same gel cell that's required to make that, to, to guide that formation of the uh, in the first place? Correct. Uh, it's the same cell that's required to guide the formation of this presynaptic site. The way these experiments were done was by driving caspases with promoters that turn on late in development. Mm -hmm. So if we, so that's a good question. So if we ablate the glia early development with phenocopy, what we see with the network reset. So we actually get we actually get fewer synapses in this in this region, as I showed in the first half of my talk. That that's published. If we take those animals and we do this experiment, we get the same result we're getting here, only that we also get a mutant pattern here. So that so so the so that suggested to us, and this is our hypothesis right now, which I'm not gonna go into in a lot of detail, but it, the glia is playing two different roles in the formation and the maintenance of these synapses, and it's doing it through different molecular cues. Uh, basically, it's, for, it's playing a role like, like Jonathan just mentioned, like and I showed in the first half of my talk, or I mentioned in the first half of my talk. It's, it's playing a role in instructing where these, these synapses are going to form in the first place. Then later in development, the glia plays a role in, in maintaining those, those connections, or, or, or rather preventing those connections from moving to this region here. We're all clear about that. Okay. 
if you that wasn't covered in this mutant because if you move the glia then you get ectopic synapses from doing that somewhere. I'll, I'll, I'll have a model to, to explain this. So this is so our data is consistent with this hypothesis. So this is what we think is going on. Normally, in 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 juvenile animals, as the animal is is uh, growing, the glia negotiates its position with the epidermal cell in a way as to maintain the, the position of the synapses in that zone to breathe. It also plays a role, as Jonathan was, was mentioning, as, as, as I showed in the first half of the talk, in the development of the synapses. In this mutant, for reasons that we don't, we don't yet know, it, this, this gene is required in the epidermal cells. When this gene is absent from the epidermal cells, then the glia is incapable of renegotiating its position. It gets distended further posterior. It's almost as if the adhesion sites between the glia and the epidermal cell are not, are not uh, renegotiated in development. And now that results in the formation of ectopic synapses in that zone one region. If you get rid of the glia, even in the new line, if you get rid of the glia, then it, looks, it comes back to like, it, look, it looks more similar to wild type. Okay. So why, so, so just to bring it, so the importance of this in, in, in terms of synaptic maintenance very quickly is that you know animals grow and synapses actually maintain the same. This is an animal from juvenile all the way to adult, and the synaptics maintain their, their positions as the animals are growing. So how do they how do they do that? And we think that in this case we have uncovered a role for the, the position of the glia in keeping the position of where the synapses are in a way that if the position of the glia is affected. Then all of a sudden, sorry, all of a sudden you have this ectopic synapses. And with that, I'll like to conclude, uh, just summarizing synaptic, we have synaptic maintenance phenotype, conserved the disease, acting in epidermal cells, and um, this is, these are the people that did the work. Uh, thank you. <laughs>